Hi everyone and welcome back to The Wheelchair Activist. This is a podcast hosted by me, Emma Vogelman, where I interview some pretty amazing disabled people as well as some amazing allies of the disabled community. Today I am talking to the fantastic Shani Danda. She is just all around one of the most incredible disabled people I have ever met. She is smashing all sorts of barriers being a disabled entrepreneur, advocate, activist, as well as an amazing Southeast Asian woman who is also providing some much needed representation to those groups. I cannot wait to hop into this conversation. The more you help a disabled employee with the right support, the right equipment and the right tools to get on with their job, the more productive they will be and the more profitability that you will have and the better culture you will have in your organisation. I regularly get trolled and there's a hierarchy in the way in which people troll me. So first they'll they'll troll me about my disability, then my ethnicity, and then if they ever get round to it, my gender. If I see another disabled person doing so, or another South Asian person, another another woman, I'm gonna support you. I'm not gonna think, oh that was my opportunity, you took it from me. Great. Well thank you so so much for joining us on The Wheelchair Activist. Can you tell our wonderful listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm Shani Danda. I'm a very, very proud Brummie. So that's someone from Birmingham who now lives in London. And I'm a South South Asian woman who experiences disability. Um, And I had an amazing 10-year career as an event manager and I am now a disability consultant, um, an inclusion strategist and I work with businesses and brands to help them to become more inclusive. I specialise in disability inclusion Um, and in addition to all of that, I'm also a social entrepreneur and a broadcaster. Amazing. Thank you so much. I was trying to um, think about how to describe you. I think it was to my producer or to other people who I was saying you were going to be on the podcast. And I thought, she wears so many hats. I don't know where to start. (laughs) That is my daily struggle. When people ask me what what I do, (laughs) I never know how to answer that question. But I I think it's really nice that, you know, I get to do so many of the things that I enjoy you know this was definitely a dream for me to be able to 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 manage all of these things and to make it all financially viable um so yeah I'm just glad that I I've been able to do that and to help to break down barriers in lots of different spaces I think what I admire about the work that you do so much is the work that you do with businesses and to try and like you said to get them more inclusive of disabled people but I'd love to know a little bit more about that sort of what are those conversations like if you're allowed to say who you have worked with and that would be super interesting but just sort of yeah how do those conversations go? Yeah so it depends really like on how much support the business might need or where they are on their inclusion journey. Um, I have to say, though, a lot of my work is very reactive. So what I mean by that is perhaps something hasn't gone quite to plan. Perhaps there's been a bit of a crisis or perhaps the organisation just needs to do better on disability inclusion. So Whilst I enjoy all of that work, I do wish a lot more of my work was a bit more proactive um, instead of just always putting out flies all the time. So what that can look like are are, are lots of different things from looking at an organization's range of policies to make sure that they're inclusive for their disabled employees, uh, looking at the brand's or business's strategy, their marketing, ensuring that they're really representing the full spe- spectrum of diversity that exists. It can even be understanding the language that a business uses. It could be workplace adjustments. It could be line manager confidence on disability. It can it can be anything really. But I think everyone knows me for my work that I do um, at Virgin Media. 
And there, you know, I always talk about this being my dream job. And if any, if anyone listening's found, uh, have seen my LinkedIn advert, that really shares the story of how I found the job on LinkedIn. And it was the job where I was able to combine all of my project management and event management experience with my uh, passion for creating disability inclusion and disability equity. Um, so I was a disability program manager there and Virgin Media had a dedicated um, plan, three-year plan, and we had an amazing partnership with Scope. And, you know, we really transformed the business. Um, and in addition to that, throughout the partnership that we had with Scope, we also helped over a million disabled people get the advice uh, and employment support to get into work. So, yeah, you know, that will always be one of my career highlights. Um, and it was, for me personally, the best ever employment experience I ever had as well. So, yeah, lo lots of positives there. Oh, wow. I it's, I mean, just a number about giving 1 million disabled people the advice to go out and seek work, stay in work or whatever that might be. I mean, that's what being a political party is put in their manifestos. And look, you're out here actually putting that into action, which is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think we could, we could talk all day really about this, but what do you feel are the biggest barriers to disabled people in the workplace or whether that's stay, getting into the workplace to begin with or staying in the workplace? I think this is a great question. And I think a lot of people often think the biggest barrier is just getting in work, but actually staying in work is equally as difficult. And again, I've had personal experience of that. So, um, when I was 16 years old, I had to apply for over 100 jobs before removing any mention of my condition. And then I was offered an interview and then I was offered a job straight away. So I had to learn a really harsh life lesson at a very young age. Um, and then I was working for a Royal Institute as an event manager. I was there for five years. And after five years, my line manager changed and suddenly my life was really made difficult at work um and after six months I just had to leave because I couldn't I could no longer work there and when I look back on that time now I wasn't given the right support from HR even though I'd raised all my concerns through the appropriate channels and a lot of people said to me well why didn't you go to an employment tribunal and I know I could have but that's not how I wanted to use my energy and Instead, I left and that organization just lost me as talent, essentially. So I just want to I just want to make really, you know, I just want to make the point that it happens to many disabled people, whether you are educated or not. And really what it comes down to is the bias that people have against disabled people and the confidence that people have not only employing disabled people, but managing disabled people, too. So removing myself out of the answer, some of the other barriers that I've seen and heard and noticed are there are a lot of myths around um, employing disabled people. So a lot of employers that think it will be really expensive, perhaps because they might need to knock down their office and rebuild it again as part of a reasonable adjustment. But that's not the case at all. What the, what the research actually tells us is the majority of adjustments actually don't cost anything maybe a little bit, but not much at all. And then, you know, we have something called access to work, which is the government's best kept hidden secret. And at the moment, I think I think the funding is around £60,000 per disabled employee to go towards helping towards the cost of any reasonable adjustments. I also think another big barrier is non-disabled employers think disabled people just have loads of time off work or there might be unsafe employees. But again, research disproves that myth as well. And actually, if I'm being really honest, 
I know I'm a very loyal employee because I'm so bloody grateful to have a job. (laughs) And I know many other disabled people will understand what I'm saying because we often overcompensate because we've Mm. struggled to get in a role. We've then struggled to perhaps keep it. And then when we have something that works for us, you know, we really overcompensate. And I remember I had this massive complex of, no, I don't want, I don't want to ever have any time off whether it was related to my disability or not, even if it was something completely separate, I I always felt it would like, it would go against me and it would be like what my line manager would be expecting, but that's so toxic. Um, So yeah, there's lots and lots of reasons, but ultimately the biggest barriers come from non-disabled people and their attitudes and their bias. There's so many things about you just said that I just completely agree with but I love that you also refer to access to work as the government's best kept secret because that's exactly what I tell people and people sort of laugh but I go no really it is and for the exact same reasons that you said you know about the amazing amount of funding that it can provide where an employer's resources can't and it's something that I don't think gets talked about nearly enough in the disabled community but also amongst employers Mm -hmm. who like you say may have that misconception around how much a disabled employee is is going to cost. Mm -hmm. I think if we're talking about access to it we have to also mention the fact that it's not the most easiest of things to apply for it's not the most easiest of things to get we are dealing with the DWP And the way that I see it is that they see it as a benefit rather than discretionary funding that's available for everybody. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I've dealt with access to work personally, but also helping other people to get the funding as well from an employee's perspective. Um, So I just wanted to caveat that. And I really, really hope that this process does get easier but I I don't want people to to be put off that that funding is there don't give up at the first hurdle and there are people out there that can help you apply for this funding if perhaps you've never done it before or if it's just a bit overwhelming I think I think we have to mention those things when we talk about access to that but on the whole it is brilliant when it works for you I completely agree the application process is not easy there are a lot of forms and there are a lot of stages even when you get the funding to actually receiving it but I agree if you can get through those hurdles then it is really great and I I want to come back to what you said about this toxic idea and this Mm -hmm. feeling that you need to overcompensate Mm -hmm. because I 100% identify with that as well I mean I felt just a past couple of months ago I'm back in April I got a really bad chest infection and I ended up being signed off work for three weeks Mm. and even though my manager was so understanding and so kind about it I felt terrible and I felt like I was like you sort of said playing into what the average employer might expect of a disabled person and You know, I think particularly when you have a visible disability and particularly a complex one, Mm -hmm. that there's this presumption that someone like me in a wheelchair on a ventilator is in and out of a doctor's office every other day. And I really didn't want to sort of fall into that. So I suppose what advice or what, you know, insight do you have for both disabled people, but also non-disabled people and how to go about challenging that if we start with what would you tell disabled people first Mm. around how to try and combat that I think really what we're talking about at at its root is internalized ableism and I think it just goes to show that no matter how much work you do no matter how long you may have lived with your condition or impairment you know it's still there it's still something that we have to actively understand you know that it's rearing its ugly head and we need to 
understand it for what it is. I'm I'm with you. Um, I had COVID really, really badly back in June 2020. And I had, I think, two weeks off work. But I was really ill. But all I was thinking about was I need to get back to work. I need to get Mm. back to work. I don't want people to think that, you know, I'm taking off time that I don't need to be. And then, I, and then actually, like, and again, like you, I had the most, you know, supportive employees and people around me. I was very grateful for that. And then I just had to stop and think, do you know what? This is a, this is a deadly virus. We're living in a pandemic. I need to give myself some time and, 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 and that grace just to, to, to go through what I need to go through and get better. Um, so I had to sort of, tell myself off if that makes sense um and I think I think that's what it comes down to is recognizing when something is our internalized ableism yeah and understanding what we do then and 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 how we recognize that and how we manage that and I think my message to non-disabled people is I can't explain the conflict that we as disabled people feel trying to manage our conditions, trying to manage our jobs or whatever we're doing in our lives and just trying to, you know, to, to live in the best way that we can. Um, and, you know, I've I've had to support many friends as well through lots of different um, situations with work. And you can clearly see when someone is literally being bullied out of a job, when people just aren't being supported because they might have a condition or an impairment. And I just, I just want to say to non-disabled people, largely it's the bias and the stigma that you project, project on disabled people that create the biggest barriers. And that also adds to our own internalized ableism. The majority of disabled people want nothing more than to get in work and stay in work we face many unavoidable extra costs. We can't afford to not work. So just make it easier for us. Be flexible in your approaches and, you know, just treat people how you would want to be treated or how you would want your loved one to be treated if they were in this situation. And I just think the more you help a disabled employee with the right support, the right equipment and the right tools to get on with their job, the more productive they will be and the more profitability that you will have and the better culture you will have in your organisation. Like I could probably talk about this for the rest of the podcast, but it's just the right thing to do, let alone, you know, commercially as well. So, Mm. yeah, it's just the right thing to do. I completely agree. And I think what's so interesting about disability is that at some point, in almost everyone's lives, they will come into contact with it, you know, and have real lived experience potentially of Mm -hmm. it, you know, and it's um, something that my friend and colleague, Elizabeth Ward, who's the first guest on this podcast, but she does content accessibility training. And she talks about, you know, various like little frustrations that people come across with digital accessibility like you're in a rush and you're trying to book something on your phone but the button to click next or whatever isn't big enough and you end Mm -hmm. up clicking the wrong thing and she'll translate that into imagine you have a disability that makes that action Mm -hmm. harder so I think Mm -hmm. it's so important for non-disabled people like you say to do that right thing Mm -hmm. because at some point, it could very well be you who's coming into contact with that particular barrier. And like you say, wouldn't you want that support to be in place for you? Emma, don't you think it's so ironic that we have to talk about disability in that way, that we have to tell non-disabled people that this might be you one day in order for get in order to get non-disabled people to actually care to Mm. perhaps do something about it to perhaps be an ally it just yeah it's so ironic it's frustrating though because it's it's something again like this is something I wanted to talk to you about Mm. but in terms of disability you know like we've said that's a group that anyone could come into so it's sort of that's the 
inherent justification for why you should care. Yeah. But what I'm so interested with you is that in addition to disability, you also do a lot of activism and sort of advocating for people of color mm. and, you know, for women. And I'm so interested how that intersectionality of those different parts of your identity come into play because, you know, race, for example, people don't become another race. It's mm. just, it's a group that you are in and there's so many amazing conversations happening around mm. why you should care about race. But yeah. I'm just interested in your lived experience with being an advocate for all of those different groups that make you who you are. Yeah. And it's exactly that, you know, it was experiencing oppression and discrimination based on the things that make me who I am. So based on the skin color that I have, based on the gender that I am, and based on the fact that I was born with a condition. And what I realized was is, so if you'd met the 20 year old version of me, I rejected anything to do with my disability identity. And so did 20 year old Emma. <laughs> I think it's it's that it's that journey we go on, right? And then I discovered the social model, which talks about how it's it's um the barriers and the bias in the world that that disable us, not our conditions that completely just changed my life. And then and then I realized, well, okay, I understand that now, but that still it there was still something missing because when I looked around I only ever saw one representation of disabled people and this was mm. largely white disabled people mostly of who who perhaps used the same mobility aids or had the same types of conditions and impairments and whilst that was great because I grew up without any full stop without any representation I thought well hang on where's my representation where where are the disabled people of color and then it dawned on me well hang on that means people in decision making positions don't understand the lives of diverse disabled people we are not all from the same communities we are not all you know in the same situations and we are not all from the same background so then I discovered intersectionality. So essentially, Emma, at any at any time I'm experiencing, when I'm experiencing any sort of oppression or discrimination, I will never know whether it's because of my ethnicity, the fact I've got a disability, or because of my gender, essentially. It could be a combination of all three. It could be one, it could be two, it could be all of them. Or maybe none of them. It could be completely something else. Mm. However, these are the most visible things about me. And and another thing that I've noticed recently since becoming um, a broadcaster and appearing on more TV programs is I regularly get trolled. And there's a hierarchy in the way in which people troll me. So first, they'll, they'll troll me about my disability then my ethnicity and then if they ever get around to it my gender but wow if I was a non-disabled cisgendered white woman I would probably only be trolled because of my gender like I see other cisgendered non-disabled white women get trolled so what we have to understand is that we are all intersectional some more visibly than others but what that means is there's lots of different ways and lots of different layers of, of marginalization and discrimination. So what that means is there's so much, so, so many more barriers for me to break on a personal level. But then I looked around and I thought, well, who, who else is doing this work? Who else is being this voice for all of these communities and all of these things? And essentially, Emma, everything that I've done or everything that I'm doing are just things that I wish existed when I was growing up or, or they're just things that I wish someone had told me or explained to me. I just want people to have, you know, a, a, a bit more of a barrier free life. And if I can help to contribute to that, then my work, you know, is going in the right direction. That's exactly how I think about what. I do. And that was a huge inspiration behind this podcast was to provide those 
figures for other disabled people. I mean, if young disabled people listen to this, that's fantastic. But even older disabled people who can't see themselves working in the corporate space yeah. like you are, or in parliament, or in medicine, or whatever field it might be, that you can start to see yourself there. But I can imagine that it was difficult for you to set out on that path because there weren't any other people like you. So you had to sort of imagine yourself in these spaces where no one who felt like that represented you really came before. So I'd be really interested to know who were your role models when you were growing up? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's so cliche, but my mom, <laughs> my mom has always been my biggest role mm-hmm. model and a massive reason as to why I am the person who I am today. And I think why I have the strength, the the emotional strength, the and, and resilience that I have. Um also, I'm Sikh, so I belong to a big South Asian community, a Punjabi community. So, so Sikhism is actually a relatively new religion. It's it's um, 500 and so years old. I should really know that. <laughs> um, anyway, the whole religion is based on equality. And this is the household and this is the community that I grew up in. Not to say that, you know, there weren't any barriers or there wasn't any discrimination in my community because there is and ironically disability does face a further sense of stigma in South Asian communities but when we just talk about religion that was a massive source of source of faith for me and even now when you know because being really honest this works hard I not only live this I'm teaching it I'm explaining it I'm breaking barriers I'm supporting people it's it, you know it can be very emotionally um mentally draining mm. and there are some days I question you know why am I doing this why don't I just go and live in a hot country and just have a stress-free life <laughs> um which is my dream um but that is, it's my religion that gives me the faith to carry on. Um, but but Emma, you know, it was it was really difficult when I was starting out because you know the the conversations that we're having now as a society we were not having back then. I I was trying to you know bring my chair and squeeze it in between folks on tables. There was just the people were not making space for me. They didn't understand why they needed to hear diverse voices, not just disabled voices, but just general diversity. And then it kind of became a trendy thing. And now we're living in a time where organizations can't hire DNI professionals quick enough. So the amount of change that I have seen, and I have to be honest, I did think, oh, okay, the world's changing now. You know, everyone knows about DNI. My work will be so much easier to do. That has slightly been the case, but not as much as I thought it would be because sadly, disability still remains the lowest prioritized on the overall DNI agenda, mm. even though it's the largest diversity strand in the world. So there's still a long way to go. Um, and why do you feel that? Is because I think we've seen so much amazing movement in the past five, 10, 20 years around race and ethnicity and around sexual orientation and gender as well. But why is it that you think disability gets so often left off of that DNI agenda? I think there's lots of reasons. I think, firstly, people aren't confident when it comes to talking about disability or understanding what disability means it wasn't that long ago in the UK that disabled people were being institutionalized and the law which said it was that it was illegal to, to discriminate against disabled people became 20 and 30 years after it was illegal to discriminate people based on their gender and their uh, ethnicity so we've always been playing catch up with disability from its from its origins of, of disability rights, essentially. And then 
we have very bad, very bad representation, which the latest stats, I believe, are telling us it's going backwards, which is shocking, Um, which is actually why I'm so grateful for social media because I am loving all of the disabled people out there, all the disabled content creators, make like taking up that space and actually mm. say, well, okay, you're not going to give me an opportunity. I'll, I'll do it myself. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have had to take that. But I'm, I'm loving seeing when you know our fellow disabled people are doing that. Um, I think as well, it's such a large and fragmented group of people we're talking about. People often don't know where to start. Um, so yeah, lo- lots of different reasons, but I think I think those are the main challenges to why. And you know, Emma, we often say this, don't we? This is the this is the diversity strand anyone can be part of at any time. And and really, what I don't understand is when we aren't thinking about accessibility, when we aren't thinking about the inclusion of disabled people, what that means is, as a society or as a population or as a country. We aren't designing for our future selves. You know, you and I already experience disabilities so we already know what it's like. And we often tell people like, this could be you, you know, this could happen to anyone. But I don't know, I just feel like it's it's not hitting home to people. I just... Mm, I think... I don't know if it's because people think it's such a remote possibility. Mm. You know, I think people view becoming disabled as oh I was in a tragic car accident that's left me paralyzed and I think Hollywood and the media have so much to do with that with Mm -hmm. films like Me Before You and stuff that paint this such negative portrayal of disability especially acquired disability but I think I just really loved what you said that we're not designing for our future selves and I think if people even thought about old age Mm -hmm. for example Mm -hmm. and sort of the mobility restrictions that come with that it's in everyone's interest for there to be working lift for example Mm -hmm. or you know whatever it might be and I think that it's I don't know about you but I find it so frustrating that Mm -hmm. disability is left out when it feels so obvious and I think For people like you and me, and I'm sure lots of other disabled people listening, we are sitting there screaming at our computers going, (laughs) but we have the answers. You know, we have ways that you can be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. I suppose in your areas of work and perhaps more when you're starting out, did you ever feel that people expected you to do all of this for free because they assumed quite rightly, though? that it's so much more than a job to you. Mm, absolutely. I think people, I get approached all the time from people that I think will will do certain things for free as well. You've like, And I understand, look, different organisations have different budgets and charities and not-for-profits and et cetera. And I do do a lot of things for free, but that's because I choose to do that or perhaps... I might be a supporter of that certain organization or you know it it depends on the relationship that I have however at the end of the day my reality is is as a disabled person I face unavoidable extra costs I face a disability pay gap so wide that we as disabled people effectively work two months of the year for free I also took a a pay cut so I had more time to lo- launch my app that I'm working on to help disabled people save money. I have bills to pay. I live in London, which is a ridiculously expensive place to live. Pay a lot of rent for somewhere that is not accessible. So there's lots of reasons, you know, personally, um, why I can't do things for free. But but also, why why is that an expectation? And I think people think that, well, you want equality, you want disability inclusion. If you want it, then you help us to do it. And, and, you know, then you've played your role and we've played ours. I think people haven't really previously taken it as a credible profession. And, yeah, sadly, people just, some people do try and get what they can for nothing. But, Emma, I'm like you, I'm really mindful of that. And if ever I've 
whenever I work with disabled people, I make sure that they're adequately paid. I've even told disabled people when they're undercharging for things as well, because I've built up so much knowledge and experience in certain sectors and through the work that I do, as well as the own learning journey that I've gone on, because I, I, I'm so happy when I see other disabled people get opportunities. I never see it as, oh, they've taken an opportunity away from me. I don't have a scarcity mindset. I truly believe there are enough opportunities out there for everybody. And don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to gloss over the fact that we as disabled people do find it difficult to get those opportunities. But I, I do believe that as long as you're a nice person, you get on with people, you're likable, you know, it's those basic things I think that sometimes people forget, then there are absolutely enough opportunities out there. So I'm all for that. And I would love to see more disabled people be like that. Because if if I see another disabled person doing so, or another South Asian person, another, another woman, I'm going to support you. I'm not going to think, oh, that was my opportunity. You took it from me. Um, so mm. I, on the topic of that, I just I just love to I would love to see more solidarity within our own community. I completely agree. And I think it goes back to what you said about disability being such a diverse group that, you know, if you are a multinational corporation or whoever you might be that wants to develop your disability inclusion at your mm. organization, if you just hire Emma Vogelman, you're going to miss out on a lot of other disability knowledge I don't have mm-hmm. and that, you know, unique insight that I never will have mm-hmm. into other conditions because I don't have them. So mm-hmm. I think it's it's important to not just view it as this is my opportunity and therefore no one else's because I think mm-hmm. it really needs to be a combination of different disabled people with different lived experience yeah coming in yeah and when I you know speak at different events and conferences I make it really clear I'm one disabled person and my lived experience is going to be very different from somebody else's and I urge people to go uh, and do their own research and I share different um social handles of other disabled people so they can go and do that easily so I I always try and uplift others wherever I can and bring people with me and that was why I created the Asian Disability Network and Asian Woman Festival because I thought you know what it's been such a hard slog for me to get to where I am I want to help others without them having to face the same barriers and and again through Asian Disability Network I've created so many different opportunities for lots of different disabled people that perhaps would never have had that opportunity otherwise because and a lot of people say this to me, they're like, oh, yeah, you, you've got a lot of firsts, like the first to do this, the first to do that. But I, while some people see that's a good thing, I think, well, actually, why? Why was I the first? I shouldn't have been the first. I don't want to be the first and I don't want to be the last. So while we think sometimes putting the first ever of this or this is a really good thing, I actually think, it, well, why? I shouldn't be shouldn't have been the first and I definitely don't want to be the last so I I'm I'm very um mindful that I you know bring people with me and uplift others wherever I can I think that's so incredibly important and I think for the large part the disabled community does that really well you know if someone needs an expert in this area you know you'll tag people on Twitter who you know who might be you know more equipped to answer that question or you know whatever whatever opportunity it might be and I suppose going on from you know you were the first person to do this and that Mm -hmm. what would you say is the hardest barrier that you've had to overcome I think um I think when I reflect on my life (laughs) so I'm 35 now um and it was six when I was 16 I I really start I really was able to start living my life at that age because my condition had stabilized I wasn't no longer constantly in hospital and for me it was 16 like it was a really pivotal 
yeah, I had freedom. I was able to go, you know, I'd finish school. Um, it was like the first time I would go out on my own as well. Uh, and I think, sadly, I think disability attitudes have got worse. So when I think about the biggest barriers, I I think it's those age age old things that we all say, like negative attitudes, poor representation, the stigma of disabled people in society or in the workplace. I know I, I'm in the corporate sector and lots of other other industries and I, I can see that there has been change but on a day-to-day level me living my life sadly it hasn't got better in terms of attitudes you know I regularly get harassed uh, the amount of time my blue badge is being stolen it's ridiculous and I'm just like when is it gonna end will it ever stop will it ever change so I think I think on a personal level, that's been really sobering to reflect on that and think I've had this from the age of 16 and I'm 35 and, you know, when is it ever going to start or decrease or, you know, change? Um, But then on the other hand, I can see really amazing things happening in in industries and in, in, you know, in the corporate space. So I just think now we need to kind of draw join the dots and understand that understand how influential businesses are in society I just don't think we can wait any longer for for the government to change things or perhaps you know make the changes that we are all desperately asking for I just think businesses need to join the dots and work with us more collaboratively um, and, 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 and help to change those daily things that we as disabled people face does that make sense Emma? it completely does and it really really resonates with me I remember having this conversation with um with the therapist at mm. the time and we were speaking about like this really big achievement that I'd had at work um and it was the launch of a report that I wrote on disabled employment and it was launched at a parliamentary reception and you know, had amazing con- like contributions from people. And it was a really amazing piece of work. But I really struggled to feel proud of it. Not because I wasn't, mm-hmm. but because when we would talk about what my day looks like, it was, and at that time I was commuting into London about three days a week. Mm-hmm. It was, the hard part of my day wasn't, work the hard part of my day was the two hours from when I leave my house Mm. to when I get to the office because of like you said all of those little attitudes from Mm. people that make your day hard and you know is a taxi driver going to overcharge me is someone going to be sitting in the designated space on the train and then make a fuss when I ask them to move and Mm. sort of all of those little things that I don't know that's the hard part mm. not that I'm proud of overcoming that necessarily but it was how you know how do you reconcile the work that you're doing which is amazing yeah. with those little daily occurrences yeah. and I would agree with you that we're seeing attitudes go backwards mm. I think you know recent research has definitely told us that attitudes towards disabled people are appalling Mm. and it's really impacting our confidence going about our daily lives and how it makes us feel Mm. and I don't know if it's because of the pandemic because Mm. it's certainly not because of people like you and like me and so many others who are just trying to plow through and provide the representation and have the conversations with government or business or Mm. whoever it might be but it's so frustrating so I really understand what you mean yeah and uh, especially in lockdown and the pandemic what kept happening to me was on that odd occasion I would need to go out to like the med a medical appointment and I remember I needed to go and get some new glasses I I would keep getting harassed each time I'd step out. And it really knocked my confidence because I thought I'm not going out as it is, which was obviously 
the bane of everybody's lives at that time. And then I thought every time I go out, something terrible keeps happening. And it got to the point where I was dreading going out. And, you know, I've never felt like that before. I've never been made to feel like that. But I think that experience of it happening in lockdown, it was so polarizing and that was all I was experiencing when I was looking so looking forward to just going to the hospital <laughs> because it was my only time out. Um, so, yeah, I think if there are any non-disabled people listening to this and, you know, I just really urge you to really consider your actions and your behaviours and the thoughts that you have around disabled people and of disabled people. And I hope that this conversation that we're having helps to highlight how, how that can affect us and how we feel in ourselves and how we go about our daily lives and I think it's safe to say this if we wanted this to be this could be our job for life Emma couldn't it but I don't want it to be mm. I, there are so many other dreams and aspirations that I have but equally like you know I, I mentioned earlier I was an event manager for 10 years and it got to the point where I thought I couldn't be part of this work. I couldn't be part of this, this change that needed to happen in society. So selfishly, please, everybody change your attitude so I can go and live off my other yeah. dreams and ambitions. <laughs> oh, I completely hear what you mean, but it's so <laughs> consuming when this yeah, happens to you is, all is. the time. And like you said earlier, you know, if you don't do it, who else is going to do it? Yeah. And it's easy for disabled people to fall into careers like yours and mine mm. because we see such a lack of other people doing it and we see such a change that's needed yeah. in society that we feel we have to throw everything into it. And I think, you know, if you ask 20-year-old Emma or 20-year-old Shani mm. what we wanted to do, like you said, it was nothing to do with disability and I'm just so interested in people's journeys from going from that person to the people who I interview on this podcast because mm -hmm. I did it I went from someone who didn't self-identify as disabled yeah. to the wheelchair activist and that's bonkers to me to yeah. think about <laughs> yes same like I'm now I call you know I'm so proud of my disability identity I could never him I could never ever have imagined feeling like this or remembering when I was much younger and shunning that part of me or that identity I I would never have imagined that this would be my life this would be the thing you know the job that, that I'd be doing and a lot of people ask ask me that like, oh did you always want to do this I was like no way like this has just happened all very organically even you know all the speaking that I do I hated public speaking I was the most reluctant speaker ever and even when you know I um started my work in in disability inclusion people would ask me to speak and I'd be like yeah sure all right then you know just just not take it not not take it seriously but I didn't I didn't understand the impact of my of my storytelling. And I also didn't understand that I should be charging for this work too. So, you know, I, I've gone on a big learning journey mm. myself too. So, yeah. That's so interesting. And it's made me sort of think, hang on, did I always like public speaking? Or did I just think, well, I don't mind sharing my own lived experience because if it's going to be a value yeah. to someone then why the hell not yeah. but yeah yeah I really see what you mean there so what advice would you first would you give to young Shani and what advice would you give to other disabled people listening to this I always struggle with this question like what advice would you give to your younger self um I think there's so much I think what I'll go with is there are enough barriers in life don't you be another one that adds to it so don't get in your own way quite often I think everybody whether you are disabled or not we can talk ourselves out of doing things we have self-limiting beliefs we often create barriers that stop us from doing the things we want to do so I made a promise to myself to not live life with regret 
because with the condition that I have, my life was difficult as a child. And as I said earlier, I didn't really feel like my life started until I was 16. And if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have said yes to half the things that I said yes to. I wouldn't have had the courage to go and pursue the things that I wanted to pursue. And also, I'm not afraid of failure because I will always learn something out of that if if something doesn't work. For example, I'm launching an app to help disabled people save money on everyday spending. I didn't realize I was setting up a tech company. I can't even use a Mac but that still didn't put me off from trying to do what I'm doing. If if I try and it doesn't work, then that's fine. I can die knowing I tried. But if if I try and it works, then I will have helped so many people and help to help businesses reach disabled customers and serve us as disabled consumers better. So that that's my view. I'm I'm always thinking in that way. Um, and then what was the other question? What advice would I give to? To other young disabled people. The advice I'd give to other young disabled people is don't think you have to have it all figured out. I really envied everybody, like my peers when I was younger, who knew what job they wanted to do, who knew what subjects they wanted to study. I never knew any of that. And to be truthfully honest, Again, because of my condition, I didn't have time to think about what my adult life would look like. So don't worry if you are one of those people who don't have it figured out. Always go with the things that you enjoy, the things that you won't mind getting up in the morning for and doing. Um, and don't, don't be afraid to try things. And if it's not for you, go and find something else. A lot of people think that by 20, you need to have figured out your profession or you need to figure, like I'm on my third career and I am loving it. And there's so many other things that I'm still going to do, hopefully if I live long enough. Um, And I'm really looking forward to that. So don't think that everything's fixed and everything's permanent. And another thing that I would say is (laughs) so many things change in our lives. I remember when I first entered the workplace, I didn't even know what adjustments I needed. I didn't know what adjustments were available. So don't be afraid to to ask and explore. And I think now more than ever, like I grew up without social media, I'm that old. Um, Now we can connect so easily with each other. So don't be afraid to reach out on, on social media to disabled people because we are a supportive community at our core. And, you know, I think we will all be willing to help um with with anything and and just share you know share our knowledge and experience and help you get there quicker (laughs) I love that and I completely agree I think there's not one disabled person that I've met that wants another disabled person to face the same barriers that they did so I completely agree you know reach out to other people learn from their benefits learn from their mistakes and yeah I just Thank you so much, Shani, for joining me and spending so much time talking to me about your amazing, amazing career. And I think if I'm right, you might be the second person that I've interviewed for this that is also on the Power 100 list. Mm. Um, So yeah, just thank you so much for this I appreciate it so much oh thank you it's been a real honor to have this conversation thank you so much for listening to this episode with Shani I learned so so much from her and cannot wait to see all of the amazing work that she carries on doing including the app that she mentioned which I think we're all going to keep a lookout for before you go I want to remind you that we do have a GoFundMe set up for this podcast. We are 100% committed to accessibility here at The Real Activist, and we want to make sure that every bit of content is inclusive and accessible to all. Every donation allows us to continue doing this work, which includes captioning each and every episode and making it available on YouTube. Thank you so, so much to everyone who has donated so far and has allowed us to continue making this amazing podcast. Please give this podcast a share far and wide so everyone can enjoy the amazing content. 
This podcast has been hosted by me, Emma Vogelman, produced by me and Isabel Anderson, and edited by Joe Tapper. Thank you so much for listening, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.